asato ma sadgamaya tamaso ma jyotir gamaya mrityur ma amritam gamaya om shanti 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 om lead us from the unreal to the real lead us from darkness unto light lead us from death to immortality om peace 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 good morning and namaste everybody and greetings also to our vast online audience which is from all across the world so many people have joined us for this session on ashtavakra i'm not saying final session because it will continue i remember just like mandukya one swami in the uh, himalayas he was starting a class on mandukya upanishad with karika so as usual there are some impatient people somebody asked in the class how long will it take how long will it take to complete it you know and the swami said uh, well the purpose is not to complete it as long as you are breathing mandukya will continue <laughs> similarly as long as we are breathing ashtavakra will continue now please join me repeat after me the verses we have done and then we'll go ahead chapter 15 verse 4 ho na te deho natvam deho na te deho bhokta karta na va bhavan bhokta karta na va bhavan chidrupo si sada sakshi chidrupo si sada sakshi nirapeksha sukham chara ನಿರಪೇಕ್ಷ ಸುಖಂ ಚರ ರಾಗದ್ವೇಷೌ ಮನೋ ಧರ್ಮೌ ರಾಗದ್ವೇಷೌ ಮನೋ ಧರ್ಮೌ ನಮನಸ್ತೆ ಕದಾಚನ ನಮನಸ್ತೆ ಕದಾಚನ ನಿರ್ವಿಕಲ್ಪೋಸಿ ಬೋಧಾತ್ಮ ನಿರ್ವಿಕಲ್ಪೋಸಿ ಬೋಧಾತ್ಮ ನಿರ್ವಿಕಾರ ಸುಖಂ ಚರ ನಿರ್ವಿಕಾರ ಸುಖಂ ಚರ ಸರ್ವೂತು ಚಾತ್ಮನ ಸರ್ವೂತು ಚಾತ್ಮನ ಸರ್ವೂತ ಚಾತ್ಮನಿ ಸರ್ವೂತ ಚಾತ್ಮನಿ ವಿಜ್ಞಾಯ ನಿರಹಂಕಾರೋ ವಿಜ್ಞಾಯ ನಿರಹಂಕಾರೋ ನಿರ್ಮಮಸ್ತ್ವ ಸುಖೀ ಭವ ನಿರ್ಮಮಸ್ತ್ವ ಸುಖೀ ಭವ ವಿಶ್ವ ಸ್ಫುರತಿ ಯತ್ರೇದ ವಿಶ್ವ ಸ್ಫುರತಿ ಯತ್ರೇದ ತರಂಗ ಇವ ಸಾಗರೆ ತರಂಗ ಇವ ಸಾಗರೆ ತತ್ವ ನ ಸಂದೇಹ ತತ್ವ ನ ಸಂದೇಹ ಚಿನ್ಮೂರ್ತಿ ವಿಜ್ವರೋ ಭವ ಚಿನ್ಮೂರ್ತಿ ವಿಜ್ವರೋ ಭವ ನಾವು ವಿಶ್ ಶಾಲ್ ಗೋ ಹೆಡ್ ಏಟ್ ವರ್ಸ್ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಚಾಂಟ್ ಚಾಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಮೀ ಶ್ರದ್ಧಸ್ವ ತಾತ ಶ್ರದ್ಧಸ್ವ ಸ್ವ ತಾತ ಶ್ರದ್ಧಸ್ವ ನಾತ್ರ ಮೋಹಂ ಕುರುಷ್ವ ಭೋ ನಾತ್ರ ಮೋಹಂ ಕುರುಷ್ವ ಭೋ ಜ್ಞಾನ ರೂಪೋ ಭಗವಾನ್ ಜ್ಞಾನ ರೂಪೋ ಭಗವಾನ್ ಆತ್ಮ ಪ್ರಕೃತಿ ಪರ ಆತ್ಮ ಪ್ರಕೃತಿ ಪರ ಶ್ರದ್ಧಸ್ವ ತಾತ ಶ್ರದ್ಧಸ್ವ ನಾತ್ರ ಮೋಹಂ ಕುರುಷ್ವ ಭೋ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಸ್ವರೂಪ ಭಗವಾನ್ ಆತ್ಮ ತ್ವಂ ಪ್ರಕೃತಿ ಪರ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಷನ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಫೇಸ್ ಮೈ ಸನ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಫೇಸ್ ನೆವರ್ ಕನ್ಫ್ಯೂಸ್ ಯುವರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಕಾನ್ಶಿಯಸ್ನೆಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ದ ಲಾರ್ಡ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ದ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಬಿಯಾಂಡ್ ನೇಚರ್ ಇಟ್ ಸಿ ವಟ್ ಬೈರಮ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಟು ಸಿ
have faith, my child, have faith. Do not be bewildered, for you are beyond all things, the heart of all knowing. You are the self, you are God. So here, Ashtavakra tries a different track. He says, there is another way. Forget your, uh, you know, the, the subtle reasonings of Advaita Vedanta, self, not self, consciousness and its objects, uh, the three states and discriminating the witness consciousness from the three states, you know, Jagrat, Swapna, Sushupti and the Turiya. Um, the five levels of the human personality from the physical, the vital, the mental, the intellect and the causal beyond that. All right, all that's very difficult, let alone bringing in, you know, as we did, bringing in Heidegger and Michio Kaku and string theory and all of that. It's natural to be bewildered with all of that. Forget it, he says. There is another straightforward way which will work right now. Shraddha Swatata Shraddha my child, just believe what I said. Just have faith on what I said, it'll work. You see, when I say there is a breakthrough, you keep, um, keep at it and there'll be a breakthrough, very clearly you will see that this is a fact. And this, one of the signs of the breakthrough will be, you will never be confused after that. It will never go away after that. It will remain effortlessly and so on. Now what happens is, all that sounds great, but I have seen the reaction of many people to that is, okay, that sounds good. Now what are you doing? I'm waiting for the breakthrough. <laughs> Again, we postpone it to the future. There is some remarkable, extraordinary event which is going to happen, I'm waiting for that. And it can happen. The thing is, it's not important. What is important is right here. And open and easy of access shining forth one way one other, a shortcut you is straight away have faith in this it works i mentioned earlier the modern non-dualist nisarga datta in mumbai who lived all his life in a slum in mumbai and fully uh, realized uh, somebody asked him how did you realize that you are brahman and he said my guru told me that I am Brahman. I believed him. And I lived accordingly. <laughs> that is the fine print. <laughs> I believed him and I lived accordingly. It does not take much of uh, technique also. Uh, even I was just talking at breakfast this morning about how Ramana Maharshi makes the breakthrough. Just simply imagining what, what would it be like when the body is gone, when I'm dead. And he suddenly realized that he is the Atman. Sri Ramakrishna, you'll find again and again, he emphasizes faith in, in the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. He says, faith is the way. He gives an example. There is a big log of wood immersed, submerged in a stream of water. I guess that's how logging goes on. And so that it is not lost, there is a rope tied to it. And one end of the rope is given to a man. And the man can hold on to the rope and slowly follow the rope down till he gets to the log. He can't see the log. And the log is very big. But the thin rope is enough to guide him back to the log, which is submerged. The rope is faith. He says, by faith it can be attained. Now, when we read that, we often we feel, oh, that's devotion, bhakti. He's talking about bhakti. We are now in non-duality. But it works here also. In the Kathopanishad, the first thing that Sri, uh, Swami Vivekananda liked Kathopanishad for is the boy Nachiketa and because he had faith. He had faith, Shraddha. So Shraddha is a word which goes very deep. It's something much more than faith. It means uh, Astikya Buddhi, that there is this ultimate reality. It's there. What these books say, it's true. I don't see it yet. It's true. Not only that, faith in oneself. I can do it. They realized, I can realize too. And I will realize in this very life. 
this faith. As you believe, so you are. And it works directly. Ashtabhakta also says in another place, whatever you believe, if you believe yourself to be free, you will be free this instant. Because actually you are free. If you believe yourself to be bound, you will be bound. That is, you will feel that you are bound. I remember this funny story I had read somewhere. It actually happened in Vrindavan, which is the place of devotion to Krishna. So there are many Vaishnava orders of monks there. They are all devoted to Krishna. But there are other groups also, including non-dualists. So this Vaishnava monk thought enough of all this faith and devotion and love. All this is, all this is so, so not logical. I want something based on reason and logic. Let me become a non-dualist. So he went to an Advaita teacher and uh, said, I want to learn Advaita. I've had enough of duali and, you know, dualism and all that faith stuff. So the Advaita teacher said, fine. Then the first thing in Advaita is the fourfold qualifications. You have to learn the fourfold qualifications. Please repeat after me, memorize. What are the fourfold qualifications? Viveka, the discernment between the ultimately real and the non-real, the, the permanent and the impermanent. He says, fine, that I understand. My Krishna was also permanent and the world is impermanent. I understand the difference. Vairagya, dispassion for the impermanent uh, and seeking after the eternal. So that also, fine, I understand. And then the next one is the sixfold discipline. We need discipline in spiritual life. Shama, repeat after me, calmness of mind. Shama, then Dhamma, control of the senses. And then um, Titiksha, spiritual toughness, fortitude, putting up with all sorts of sufferings on the spiritual path. And then Shama, Dhamma, um, Titiksha, Uparati, withdrawal from um, sensory engagement and enjoyment. And then all of this, the Vaishnava monk was nodding. Yes, yes, all this, it, it is in our path too. And I'm a monk also, so I practice all these things. Then Samadhana, focus. Uparati, then Samadhana, focus. Yes, of course, focus. You have to focus on God. You can focus. I guess you're going to tell me to focus on the self. Fine. Then he says, Shraddha, <laughs> faith. And the Vaishnava monk immediately became furious. What? Faith here too. Then in Hindi he said, to mere Giridhar Gopal kya dosh kiye te? What, what harm, what is the fault of my beloved Krishna then? In that path, it's faith, faith and faith. Mm -hmm. And of course, mumukshutvam, the intense desire to be free. Yes, faith here will work. Because it is true, you make a firm determination, I am Brahman. You don't have to make huge changes to your life right now. But notice that I am Brahman and I hold on to this. Think that I am Brahman. Live like this, that I am Brahman. Um, one Swami whose works are available in Hindi only, is one of the greatest uh, non-dualist teachers in the 20th century in India, Swami Akhandananda Saraswati. He was a great scholar, a pundit, a married man, a pundit. And he used to go around, um, you know, what is called Bhagavat Katha that he would go around different places and organize talks on the Bhagavad, which is basically uh, devotion, knowledge also, devotion. Stories of the avatars of Vishnu, stories of Krishna, very popular. Now he says, how did he become a monk? So he says that uh, he used to go every year to Haridwar, Kankhal, on the foothill, foothills of the Himalayas. And he would organize a 10 day uh, recitation of the Bhagavad. And there he would go and pay his respects to the, the, uh, you know, the noted, the esteemed monks of the, the place of monks. So many monks and ashrams are there. One specially, Bhikshu Shankarananda. There was a very radical non-dualist monk, Bhikshu Shankarananda. His name was Shankarananda. Uh, by the way, one of our Swamis, Swami Dhireshanandaji, uh, he used to remain, he was in Kankal, a very senior monk, um, disciple of Swami Shivanandaji. And he was very interested uh, in the wisdom of the monks in the Himalayas. So he would go around collecting it. He would visit them, write down what their teachings. And he used to go to his Bhikshu Shankaran and then later he published a booklet about him also. Anyway, so this Pandit, his name was Shantanu. So this uh, Pandit Shantanu, he would go to this uh, Bhikshu Shankarananda and uh, 
uh, he said one day I had this desire. I, I told him, Swami, if, would I would it be all right if I recited the Bhagavat to you, the stories of Krishna? Because he was hesitant. His Swami is all about I am Brahman, and there seems to be no trace of softness and you know sweetness and devotion in him. But anyway, I'd like to tell. And uh, Bhikshu Shankaranda said, yes, you can tell me. So every day he said, I would finish my um, the Bhagavad recitation for the public. And then I would visit this monk who stayed on a, in, a, in a corner of a, you know, like, a, like an ash, ashram under a tree, basically. And his entire dwelling was a cot. He would lie down on the cot. An extreme non-dualist. You'll, you'll understand by this, the Swami was once asked, Sir, you are a non-dualist, Advaitin. We always feel that non-dualists have lots of books, you know, <laughs> They're surrounded by books. But yeah, you don't have any books. There's no books around you. Yeah, where are your books? So Shankarananda said, oh, I have three books and I read them every day. What are those three books? Waking, Dreaming and Deep Sleep. Jagrat Swapna Sushupti. And I realized that I am the Turiya in which all of these appear and disappear. So these are my three books, which I read every day. So to this Swami, the Pandit would go and recite a very devotional text. And on the last day, this is when my recitations were over and I was to, supposed to go back to my home in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, I went and bowed down to this Swami, recited as usual, and I was going to take leave of him. And I looked up this austere monk, absolutely dedicated non-dualist. He had tears in his eyes. And... Uh, when I bowed down and I said, I'm leaving tomorrow, he said, I have to give you something, Guru Dakshina. Something has to be given because you recited the Bhagavad to, him, to me. So come tomorrow early in the morning in that little hut on the bank of the Ganga. I will give you Guru Dakshina. So the Pandit said, all right. Next morning he went early in the morning and that monk Shankarananda was waiting for him on the bank of the Ganga. And then he went there, he pulled him close sort of yanked him close and whispered into his uh, ears, Tattvamasi, you are that. Realize that you are Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. That's all. And then that Pandit writes that from that day onwards, he says in Hindi, Mera jeev bhav chala gaya. the whole idea that I was a limited sentient being, this person, it went away just by hearing this. After that, till today, I've never been able to think of myself other than as I am Brahman. Years later, he became a monk and one of the greatest teachers of non-duality. Uh, but his, all his books are in Hindi. In fact, the classic books, his best books are two sets. One is the set of the Bhagavatam in two big volumes. And one is the set of the Mandukya Karika in four volumes. The, all the classes which I give a lot of it is drawn from his um, teachings. But see, he said it. And I believed him. And from that time onwards, I couldn't, I could never think of myself as a limited human being. Shraddhasva tata shraddhasva. Natra moham kurushva bho. Bho means, oh, addressing somebody. Oh, my child. Tata means my child. Oh, my child, do not be confused on this, this point. Moham, delusion is of two kinds. One is impossibility and one is contrary. Impossibility is, this is not possible. I am this little body, this creature of flesh and blood. What is this Brahman, infinite awareness, consciousness? And we were just hearing, Satyam, Jnana, Manantam, Brahma. Infinite existence and consciousness is Brahman. Well, you might say, good for Brahman, but not me. Unfortunately, I am not that. You are that right now. You're not seeing this. This, this, is, this, is, this confusion is called uh, asambhavana, impossibility. Do not fall prey to that. See through it clearly and see how I am Brahman. And the other one is contrary. Contrary tendencies means viparita bhavana, which means I sort of get it, but I continue to behave as a, and react to the world as a limited person. I am there, others are there, these are good, these are bad, I like this, I hate that, I want these things in life, I want to give up those things in life, these are my projects in life, uh, individual sentient being. I continue to behave like that. That is called the contrary tendencies. So these are the two types of moha, 
delusion. Do not fall prey to this. I have absolute conviction. I believe I am Brahman. It should be equal to I know I am Brahman. Then you will see, you be careful to see your behavior, how we think, how we speak, and how we behave falls in line with my understanding. Then what is it that we, we should have no confusion about? What is it that we are supposed to uh, believe, have faith in? He repeats it. We know. You all know. Ashtavakra has only one message. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. He puts it very beautifully. Jnana saru, Swarupo Bhagavan Atma. Atma, the self. You. And God. Bhagavan. You are the same. How? How am I the same? Jnana Swarupa as pure consciousness. You are pure consciousness. God is pure consciousness. It is one and the same reality. This is a Mahavakya. Mahavakya? Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. Tattvamasi, that thou art. Pragyanam Brahma, consciousness itself is Brahman. Uh, I am Atma Brahma, this very self is Brahman. There, Brahman and Jiva, Jiva Brahma Aikyam, the oneness, the identity of Jiva and Brahman are. Uh, um, so can we add the fans? On? It's becoming rather warm, I think. Here, is it possible? Okay. Fan or the AC, whatever. Hmm. Do you feel it, or is it just me? Oh, yeah. Little, little warm, huh? Yeah. Fan or AC, whichever, something will do. Jnana Swarupo Bhagavan Atma. Here, um, what is Mahavakya, the great saints? What is the definition? Definition is Jiva Brahma Aikyam, which talks about the identity of the sentient being and God, the individual being and the cosmic, the oneness. How can the individual and the cosmic be one? Impossible. How can one be equal to million? Impossible. But it's possible when you realize the individual is nothing but pure limitless consciousness and God is also nothing but pure limitless consciousness. That sense they're equal. That is the technique by which we understood the Mahavakyas. If you have read Vedanta Sara, if you remember Bhagatyaga Lakshana, Soyam Devadatta, this is that Devadatta, all those things we did, long discussions, all of that is packed into Jnana Swarupo Bhagavan Atma. Bhagavan, Saguna Brahman, Ishwara, God, whom we worship. Atma, you or I. They're the same. How are they the same? Jnana Swarupa. You are Jnana Swarupa. Bhagavan is Jnana Swarupa. Jnana Swarupa, pure consciousness. In that sense, they are the same. How can a bracelet and a necklace be the same? Even the names are not the same. One is bracelet, another is necklace. Even the shapes are not the same. They don't look alike. Even the use is not the same. Necklace you put on your neck and the bracelet on your, on your wrist. Then how are they the same? It is the same because it is the same gold, which was at one time the bracelet it has been melted down and the necklace you are wearing was the same gold which you were earlier wearing as a bracelet on your wrist. It is literally the same substance, same reality. So that reality here is Jnana Swarupa, pure consciousness. Swarupa Jnana. One more distinction. You have heard this again and again, but it's good to repeat. When I say Jnana, knowledge, here, or consciousness, there are these two, dis this distinction we must be aware of. Vritti Jnana and Swarupa Jnana. Vritti Jnana. What is Vritti Jnana? That knowledge which is born of modifications of the mind. What is this modification? I, haven't, I don't know. What you're doing right now is modifications of the mind. Vritti Jnana. You see something uh, that perceptual knowledge, the, these uh, eyes, the, uh, percep the, the visu visual system will dump that knowledge, that information in your mind. It will set up a ripple in your mind about the contents of what the eyes have bought from the world and presenting to you. That ripple is called Vritti. Any movement of the mind is called Vritti. Any thought, any memory, any perception, any idea, any feeling, all of that is vritti, just a movement in the mind. And each vritti has a content. 
these are called vritti jnana and they come and go and they are all different from each other they are all about something they have a content all of this is lit up shining in it is the reflected consciousness in that vritti that is called chidabhasa reflected consciousness reflected awareness and what is it a reflection of jnana swarupa pure consciousness repeating again when you talk about consciousness or not whatever word you use knowledge there is vritti jnana and swarupa jnana um, the mind modification based knowledge and knowledge in itself or consciousness in itself pure consciousness so here is talking about swarupa jnana pure consciousness atman is swarupa jnana this is the whole uh, uh, issue where uh, consciousness studies is stuck when you say in consciousness studies if you ask what are you studying what's your subject give me some examples of what you are studying so all the examples they will give you are vritti jnana so are they different no not really none of this vritti jnana is possible without the swarupa jnana because that same consciousness is shining in and through that just as moonlight is not possible without sunlight and in advaita you go further even the vrittis themselves the mind itself the body itself the world which it captures all of these are also appearances in consciousness of course that's non duality swarupa jnana jnana swarupa bhagavan atma you atma are none other than the supreme lord one and the same as jnana swarupa then dualistic schools will uh, um, kick up a the kick up a storm sacrilege sacrilege you fools you are equating yourself with god omnipresent omniscient omnipotent god you little weakling weakling born the other day going to die tomorrow like you can be knocked out by one little scared big big people sitting there scared wearing mask for a tiny little virus you say i am god what can be more stupid than this is sacrilege i tell you here if to point out notice in what sense you are saying atma only as pure consciousness and saguna brahman only as pure consciousness are one and the same you are not saying that this individual person with two legs and two arms and uh, this person walking around here is god that is that is uh, megalomania of the highest order that story is there of ramdas um so his brother was in a lunatic asylum because he claimed so he went to visit his brother by that time he was this great teacher and all so he had gone and he went to see his brother and his brother said you know it's so unfair you say you are shiva and every shivoham and everybody bows down to you and praises you to the highest what a great teacher i say i am shiva come and worship me they lock me up <laughs> where is the fairness in that here is the distinction the ramdas replied but brother when i say i am shiva i mean that i am and you are and everybody else is there is only one reality shiva alone is shining forth as this universe when you say you are shiva you mean you this particular person is shiva and the world should come and worship you <laughs> that is madness this is enlightenment tvam prakriti paraha you are beyond prakriti see again how vedanta sar is so useful the first line of Veda, important line of vedanta sar if you remember vastu satchidananda madvayam brahma agyanaadi sakala jada samuha avastu the reality is non dual brahman existence consciousness bliss starting from maya onward agyana ignorance downwards everything maya and all its products down to this entire universe is unreal is an appearance and this is the you know brahma satyam jagat mithya so vedanta sa that's the first thing that's the central conclusion of vedanta brahman is the reality the world is an appearance this is exactly what is being said tvam prakrite para you transcend maya you transcend prakriti you transcend ignorance here you see this ignorance maya prakriti if you take it as unreal and that which transcends maya brahman alone that is real you alone that is real you have advaita vedanta if you take this prakriti maya um 
as not ignorance, but Prakriti or Maya as the power of Brahman. Yes, Brahman transcends Maya, but Maya is not unreal. It's the power of Brahman. Then you have Tantra, you have Kashmiri Shaivism. If you take them as two realities, you who transcend Maya or, or Prakriti, and Prakriti is another reality cooperating together, that is Sankhya. I'll repeat again. When he says, you are beyond Prakriti, you are the reality, like Vedanta Sara says, Prakriti and everything. Prakriti means nature. Nature and all her products are appearances in you. Advaita Vedanta, non-duality. You take that, that you are the reality, your power is Prakriti. You are Shiva, your power is Shakti. The power is not unreal. Sri Ramakrishna emphasized this again and again and again. That which is Shiva is also Shakti. What you call Brahman, I call Kali. Then you have Tantra, Kashmiri Shaivism, Shakta Dvaita. These are different systems. They all say the same thing. I mean, in principle. I can, I can, in my mind's eye, I see entire ranges of um, pundits looking aghast at me. What do you mean they say the same thing? <laughs> in principle, as far as this is concerned. And if you don't talk about God at all, just talk about two realities, material and conscious, Prakriti and you, then you have Sankhya. You have Patanjali Yoga. All right. Now we move on. The next two verses, we will take them together, are beautiful verses and very encouraging, very powerful, but also radical. They, how do you face death? How does Ashtavakra face death? So we will do verses 9 and 10. Soaring, sublime, but also can be scary. Gune samveshtito deha. Gune samveshtito deha. Tishthatyayati yati cha. Tishthatyayati yati cha. Atma naganta naganta. Atma naganta naganta. Kimenam anushochasi, Kimenam anushochasi. Let us read the translation. The body composed of the ingredients of nature comes, stays, and goes. The self neither comes nor goes. Why then do you mourn it? What does Byron say? The body is confined by its natural properties. It comes. It lingers a while. It goes. But the self neither comes nor goes. So why grieve for the body? Then the next one. Dehas tishthatu kalpantam gachat Dehas tishthatu kalpantam Dehas tishthatu kalpantam gachatvadyeva vapunaha gachatvadyeva vapunaha kvavriddhi kvacha vahani kvavriddhi kvacha vahani tava chinmatra rupinaha tava chinmatra rupinaha let the body last to the end of the kalpa, the cycle. Or let it go on even today. Let it go even today. Where is there any increase or decrease in you who are pure intelligence? Let us see what Byram says now. If the body lasted till the end of time, or vanished today, what would you win or lose? You are pure awareness. Hmm? Nicely said. If the body lasted till the end of time or vanished today, what would you win or lose? You are pure awareness. Gune samveshtito dehaha. The body is made of prakriti, of nature, of maya. What is maya made of? Sattva rajastamas. And the products. Products? 
sky and air and fire and water and earth, the, the elements of the periodic table, they go to make this body. Whatever is compounded, Bhagavan Buddha, 2,500 years ago, all that is compounded will perish. That which has been put together will fall apart. All compounded things decay. Well, okay, finally, if they decay, no problem. Right now, as long as it doesn't decay right now, it is decaying all the time. It is falling apart all the time. It is changing continuously. Anityam, anityam, sarvam, anityam. Impermanent, impermanent. Indeed, all is impermanent. Kshanikam, kshanikam, sarvam, kshanikam. Momentary, momentary. Indeed, all is momentary. Shunyam, shunyam, sarvam, shunyam. Empty, empty. Indeed, all is empty. And the Buddha says, Thus see all of creation, the entire universe, including your own body, your own thoughts, personality, all of it, as a flash of lightning in the, uh, in the uh, clouded sky. A flash of lightning. As a bubble, as a dew drop on the lotus leaf. Just now it will fall. Or he says, as a bubble in a fast moving stream. Uh, flash of lightning in the sky, as a bubble in a fast moving stream as a phantom in the night. Thus seeing, realize, O Bhikshu, realize, O monk, Dukkham, Dukkham, Sarvam, Dukkham. Sorrow, sorrow, all is sorrow. They say, for the, for the thinking person, for the sensitive person, all is sorrow. So for those who do not think, there are problems and sorrows which I have to avoid. And there are many nice things which I can chase. So Swami Tapasyanji, it seems, used to say that Buddhism is a serious religion. It doesn't begin for you also until you accept the first noble truth. Everything here is sorrow. <laughs> talk about raining on your parade. <laughs> everything here is sorrow. If you think about it, then everything here is sorrow. Sorrow not because... Uh, it, it, sorrow because of the very structure of this universe because it changes it is subject to continuous change why should change be sorrow? changes can be fun also the problem is our fun, our happiness, our satisfaction if you, it depends on a certain setup I want my health to be like this I want my looks to be like this I want my bank balance to be like this I want people to behave with me in this particular way and I want certain goals which I am moving towards achieving and certain nice memories to look behind. And all of this is the perfect setup and it should continue. Now you must see, to come to this perfect setup in a world which is whirling mass of change, it may come to the perfect setup which you like. It may fall into place. But because it is changing next moment, you change. Your perfect setup change. Then upset. Set up not to our liking, then we become upset. And if it's continuously subject to change, then most of the time we're going to be upset. There are only one or two setups which we like and everything else we don't like. Not only that, death is there. The final falling apart of this physical body. So, gunai samveshtito deha, tishthati ayati yati cha. It comes. It stays for some time and then it goes. Inevitably, you cannot stop it. Nobody ever can stop it. You may be the most fully realized non-dual uh, Brahman ever. You can't stop the body from disappearing. This is the very nature of the body. Now, he says, but you, awareness, in which this entire drama unfolds, you neither come nor go. Naganta, Naganta. You are not something that goes away, not something that comes. There was never a time when you were not there. There will never be a time when you will not be there. As existence, as consciousness, you are immortal. As body, continuously dying, all the time dying. Kime na manusho chasi. Why do you grieve? Why do you grieve? One, I still remember one of our monks who taught us when we were uh, novices. He says, it's like 
Remember, it is in Calcutta, hot and humid. So if I put an ice cube on the table here, we were already melting. So he says, if I put an ice cube, the ice cube is going to melt. I mean, all the monks starting, we were sitting there in, list, in the class, we felt we were melting, it was so hot. If you put ice cube, it's going to melt. And if you put ice cube, it's melting and you start um, wailing. Oh, why is it melting? Oh, alas, the tragedy of it all. It's like that, weeping for the body. So are we dismissing death? Are we being, are we trivializing death? Some people might say you are, um, you're, you're trivializing, trivializing such a great tragedy. No, Advaita Vedanta does not trivialize, just tells you the truth the way it is. Are you denying death altogether? Not at all. It is true that it is very sad also in this sense that that person whom we loved, liked, lived with, that person is truly gone. As pure consciousness, as the Atman, it's there. As the, even the Jivatman is there, but the Jivatman is not equal to the person. It was this person in this life, some other person in another life. In a future life, it will be another person. So if you say, no, I love this person. Father, mother, grandmother, grandfather. So this person I loved so much. That person is truly gone. In that sense, death is real. It's done and gone forever. But something deeper and higher was always there, is there. Not only that, that beloved person whom you have lost, the deepest reality of that, that person, really who that person is, and really who you are, are one and the same reality. You're always one with them. You can say that sounds very abstract, philosophy. not at all. That's very real. That's the reality. Hmm. Sri Ramakrishna's example is there, that uh, um, his beloved nephew, Akshay, when he died, Sri Ramakrishna was standing, the boy was a young boy dying of uh, uh, illness. Others were wailing and he, Sri Ramakrishna was in an ecstatic mood standing and watching the scene and smiling. They thought he was cruel. How can you smile at this point? And later he explained, I saw that nothing has happened. It's like a sword being taken out of its scabbard. You know, sword is kept and is taken out. So the the sentient being, the Jivatma, who is this boy, he's leaving this body. He's still there. But the next moment, when he came down from the state, he wept bitterly. He said, I felt the loss of the boy so keenly. It was like a towel, a wet towel. In India, when you take a bath, you wipe yourself, and then you wring that towel, wring it dry. It was like my heart was of this towel, which was being wrung dry inside. There's so much pain and sorrow for the loss of this part. So there's the avatar who shows the entire range. It was entirely like um, the Everest, or a high Himalayan peak, absolutely unaffected, towering over every one of us. It's not much use for us. It might be very inspiring, but if he feels the same pain that we feel, the same sorrow and loss we feel, and then he shows how one can transcend it, then it's useful for us. He is a bridge between the finite and the infinite. That is avatar. Totapuri wouldn't feel that, that pain. That, uh, he would say, why are you crying? It's just the body is gone. But that's the, for the person who is in, in samsara, uh, feels keenly the loss of uh, beloved ones. This is an important message for this time. It's a time of great trial, suffering and loss in the last one and a half years. I was just reading today, um, we are seeing the sharpest um, rise in mortality rates since World War II because of the COVID. And this is an all worldwide. This is sorrow, loss, death, everybody faces, every family faces, but we face it separately in our own private worlds of grief. And the world goes on. But in times of something like this, like a pandemic, it's almost the whole of human civilization faces it together. So we realize the universal truth of death, of loss, of suffering. What the Buddha had said, simple but powerful truth 2,500 years ago. All compounded things decay. The Buddhist monks, they do this wonderful sand mandala. Have you seen? Very intricate art they make. It takes a lot of concentration for a period of, I think, seven or nine days they do it. And that depicts the cosmos, not just the physical cosmos, the spiritual cosmos also, all the deities and the powers and shaktis. 
And then one day they will sweep it all aside. You might think so much hard work went into it. Well, that is the nature. That is the lesson. It will all be swept aside. And again, something will come back. Nature will produce. Every year, we are having going to have fall soon. All this luxurious foliage will, will turn red and brown and gold and, and then fall. And again, it will come next year. Then he says, next one. This is the attitude of the um, of the of the jnani. Let the body remain for till the end of the ages, till the end of the eons, kalpa. Or more reasonably, let it remain for 100 years, 120 years, whatever we see in this life, let it remain. I have no problem. Or let it die today. We'll get scared. No, 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 not today. <laughs> Give me a few years. No, let it die today. Today, by the end of today, but this body will go. What happens? He says, completely unperturbed. You are completely unperturbed. He says, chin matra rupina. Consciousness only. Your consciousness only. In you appeared a body, a baby, a child then a teenager, then a young person, middle-aged person, an um, old person, then a dead body. You are the same unchanged consciousness. You're not a baby consciousness or a young consciousness or an old consciousness. Chin matra, consciousness only. You're not consciousness plus body, not even a body with consciousness. Your consciousness in which a body appeared, appeared. Consciousness never became a body. Let a movie play on the screen. Screen is not affected thereby. Let the movie stop. Screen is not affected thereby. And tomorrow in the morning, let the show resume again. The screen is not affected thereby. He says, now, If the body remains for a hundred years, what have you gained? What, how are you more than you were? You are pure consciousness. Can you be more? The ocean, if huge waves come up in the ocean, has the ocean become more? It's the same water. Now it's in a wave. If the waves subside, has the ocean become less glorious? It's the same water. You are the ocean, the same ocean, the same consciousness, not one bit more, not one bit less, whether the body is there or not there. Let hundreds of bodies come and go. They are coming and going anyway. completely unmoved. You are this mass, endless mass of consciousness. You are not, you do not gain by the uh, arising of a body, by the health of the body. You do not lose by the sickness of the body, old age of the body, even death of the body. You are not reduced that much also. Ko vriddhi, ko hani. Where is your gain? Where is your loss? Now moving to 11th verse. Tvayananta maham bodho Tvayananta maham bodho Vishwavichi swabhavata Vishwavichi swabhavata Udetu vastamayatu Ude tu vastamayatu Nate vridhi navakshati Nate vridhi navakshati In you who are the infinite ocean, not a watery ocean. I say, but Swami, that's what it means. We are mostly made of water. We learned in physics and <laughs> biology. No, not a watery ocean. You are the ocean of existence consciousness. You, in the, you who are the infinite ocean, let the waves of the universe rise or fall according to their own nature. What is their own nature of the waves? Law of karma, causality. That means no gain or loss to you. When the waves are more, as the ocean become more, not at all. Even the greatest of tsunami waves, has the ocean increased a little bit? No, all of that water is the ocean's water. It just looks different. A lot of activity is going on now. 
When all of it subsides, has the ocean become less? No, it's the same water. It has not increased in quantity or decreased in quantity. Similarly, in you, the infinite ocean of existence consciousness, the universe, Vishwaviji, the waves of the universe arise by their own nature. What is their own nature? Causality. Cause and effect makes these waves move. They arise, they play around, and they disappear. He says, Nati vriddhi navakshati. You neither gain nor do you lose anything. This ocean metaphor is used again and again in the Ashtavakra. He loves the ocean metaphor. Um, yesterday we did some. There's another one. Maya nanta maham bhodo. Ascharyam jiva vichaya. Udyanti gnanti khelanti. In me, the infinite ocean of existence and consciousness. How wonderful are these sentient beings, these jivas. They are like little waves who arise in me. I am the ocean in which all beings are like waves, including this being. They are like waves who arise in me. Individuality, mind, body, birth, growth. They arise in me. What do they do? Uh, Udyanti, they arise, they are born. Uh, Kelanti, they play. Gnanti, they fight. Pravishanti, they die and disappear back into me. Swabhavata, by their own nature, by their past law of karma, they are coming and going. Ascharyam, how wonderful these, uh, these little creatures are. <laughs> I remember when this verse was being done, we were studying Ashtavakra with this teacher in the Himalayas. Uh, he was teaching in Hindi. He was a Punjabi monk. So uh, he, he, would, he had this humor, sense of humor. He was a huge man, towering over all of us. Uh, he, he was saying, Ascharyam Jeeva Vichaya, how strange are these beings who arise in this ocean of existence, consciousness, place? What are they? Why are they strange? Um, Kelanti, they play with each other. He, he's showing like this, you know, he's showing like this. Love, love, then uh, gnanti, they fight with each other, divorce, divorce, divorce. <laughs> and then ultimately what happens? What's the common end of all of them? Pravishanti, they disappear back into the unmanifest, where they had all arisen from. What a drama. <laughs> if you are one of those creatures, it's not a drama, it's a tragedy. <laughs> it's terrible. You're, you'll be ground down by the machine of this universe. But if you are the consciousness, place, existence place in which this whole game is appearing, if you are the screen of the movie, if you are the dreamer of the dream, eh, you're fine. And Ashtavakra is telling you that you are that. Stay there. Know that you are that. That will help you. That knowledge itself will help you when the ups and downs come, in the midst of the ups and downs. The Advaita is not for wiping out the experience of the universe. You need not switch off the movie. Once you realize a movie, it's a movie, you need not switch it off. Even the worst of tragedies does not affect the screen. In the, even the most uh, you know, feel good of movies doesn't make the screen any better. The screen neither gains nor loses anything by the movie. The screen is not affected by the movie. Does the screen? Do you say to the screen, uh, you know, that was a really hard movie to watch. I'm very sorry we played it on you. Uh, are you all right? Are you okay? The screen says, fine, play it as many times as you want. Without the movie, the screen is still the same. At night when the, all the movies are switched off. In Mahapralaya, when the worlds disappear, the universe is not there anymore. And we want to switch up the ACs. Yeah. yeah. In Mahapralaya, when the universe disappears, there are no worlds. The jivas, we sentient beings are not there anymore. Everything disappears. Who is there at the end of the universe, according to in Vedanta, is Ishwara and Maya. Ishwara with the power of of course, Ishwara means Maya is there, the power of Maya. Where is the universe? It's not gone. It's gone back to the uh, potential state, the seed state. Where are the seeds? In Maya. Where are we? In Maya, in our seed state, potential state. What is the seed state? It's like what we have in deep sleep. It's just a longer deep sleep. 
millions of years maybe who knows timelessness uh, but nothing is gone at one time again ishwara will project forth the universe big bang or big bangs multiple universes will project it forth and planets will evolve life will evolve and the bodies will evolve and then he will send forth collect from maya the, the seeds and send us forth again those sentient beings who have not yet uh, attained enlightenment they will get another crack at it another chance at it new universe and we will have many more lives to lead, lead until we get enlightenment those who are enlightened they are no longer in that seed from the seed itself is the agyana the, the uh, seed of maya that is gone so they are never born again they remain in one with brahman you you are you become or you realize you are the infinite but until that time this cycle will continue nothing is lost our past karma also will be there in the seed form just the game will stop when the universe is not there because the playground is not there you can't play when the playground is under water when everything is fine again and the universe has been recreated second another cycle this is the vedantic idea you are sent forth to play again until your play is done yesterday we were reading the self in all uh, and the all in the self swami vivekananda says and the all has I, the i has all become and the all is i and bliss no more is birth no more is death no more is the soul nor god he says nor man nor god the i has all become the all is i and bliss no thou art that say om tat sat om when will that happen it can happen right now that's what is ashtavakra's message what is the distance between a character in the movie and the screen what is no distance little bit the character in the movie will say i understand your whole screen theory but i have to do certain practices to become the screen and a little journey is left i'm almost there what is the distance between the wave in that lake and the water of the lake what is the dis distance between the table and the wood constituting the table there is a distance what is that distance ignorance ignorance the distance is stupidity one so i mean uttarakhand he said this word he said beukufi matra when you say maya a cosmic ignorance all sounds well that sounds pretty tough he says it's stupidity it's beukufi matra is foolishness alone that is the only difference between you and the absolute reality brahman yes Prabhupada, you can you say question is when you say the universe and everything including the body including the thoughts as an appearance in consciousness how should i understand that should understand it as just as look at your experience understand it as a dream the people you saw in a dream their appearances in your mind they actually were not there and the movie there there are no people there are no no cars and uh, cities and buildings but they are all appearances how do you apply to the waking state notice what is the difference here what was uh, screen and movie and easy to understand dreamer and uh, the contents of the dream also easy to understand you understand that whatever is in the screen is an appearance it's not really that there are people there cars and, and cities there no whatever is there in the in the dream is also an appearance so it seems very real but when i come out of it it's an appearance and it's nothing other than i the dreamer similarly here in consciousness everything that we experience the the claim is it's an appearance in consciousness we so advaita would say what else could it be we say no no it's not an appearance there is a person there there is a chair there and the person is sitting on the chair it's quite apart from my consciousness that is our point it is external to my consciousness it exists by itself or the buddhist would say it exists from its own side by itself it exists i have nothing to do with it i can come and experience it yes i mean i experience it i experience it in my consciousness but there is a reality outside 
Um, Gaudapada would say, isn't it exactly the same in a dream? When you go in a dream, when you're in a dream, doesn't it feel I'm talking to my friend and my friend is outside me. I'm taking a cup of coffee. The coffee is outside me. Now I put it inside me. And when I wake up, what would it be like? I, friend, coffee, <clears throat> everything was an appearance and it was in my mind. Well, isn't that so? How uh, is it different here? Because we think it's outside. In the dream also, we thought it was outside. And all right, that's an argument. But in dream, it was not really outside. We woke up and we realized it was in the dream. But here, we, uh, we are not waking up from this. It still feels outside. All right, consider it. This um, um, table, it's there. You, how do you know it's outside? I see it. But what is seeing? You'll see it as a shape, a color, a certain size, a certain distance. The distance, color, shape, structure, what you are seeing, is it anything apart from that perception of seeing? What I'm saying is, you say, yeah, I'm seeing it, but there is a table outside. Are you having two pieces of information? Are you experiencing two pieces of information? One is seeing the gap and the uh, shape and the color of the table. This is exactly what you are seeing. And also another piece of information, something called outside and there it is. Are you seeing that? No. Follow this carefully. When you see the table as if outside, all that, there's, that is there is seeing itself. This table, color, shape is nothing other than the information you've got is the seeing itself, the perception itself. And the perception is, if you look at it closely, attend to the perception. Now drop the idea of something apart from the perception being there. That's a notion I have got, but there's no direct evidence of that in my experience. I'm not experiencing an external table. What am I experiencing? If I'm careful to that experiencing, I will say I'm experiencing seeing a table. And if I break it down further, I'm experiencing a color, a shape, a certain distance, certain characteristics, but they are all within my seeing, within seeing. Now look, attend to the seeing itself. Notice the entirety of the seeing is in the mind. I am, there is no part in this where I have direct experience of uh, eyes and the optic nerves and electrical in the, the image formed in the retina and the little electrical bursts going along the optic nerves to the brain centers. None of that, all that I've read, but my experience is only of the seeing and the seeing is entirely mental for me. The uh, light, the eyes, the entire inside the neurological system of seeing, none of that is in my experience actually. My, in my, this experience of seeing is just seeing and it's seeing in the mind. <clears throat> mind, it is mind, internal, but go further. Attend to the mind. In the mind, whatever I'm experiencing, like seeing a table, not one bit of it is other than awareness. In awareness arises this vritti, this modification of the mind, seeing table. So now we see the steps you've gone from a notion of an external independent reality existing outside me. I say that if I'm true to my experience, it is the experience of seeing. Step one, I'll come to you. Step two, I see that seeing is entirely mental actually. Even the idea of a body, eyes, all of this is mental actually in the mind. Step three, whatever is in the, in the mind is shining in consciousness, is revealed in consciousness. Do I have any notion of anything mental which is beyond the edge of consciousness? Here is my consciousness up to this and beyond this is mind. No. I see everything in the mind. I see the mind in consciousness. Whatever is in consciousness must be pervaded through and through by consciousness. It is consciousness alone. It is internal to me. And internally also, it doesn't exist like a um, you know, table and a book on the table. It is nothing but that. When I say table is internal to the wood, it's not that there is wood and in that there's one table. 
It is this consciousness alone which appears as mind, mind and the perceptions and then an externalized notion of a world out there. In dream, it's the same thing. In waking, also, it's the same thing. Do you have a question? So, from <clears throat> anything. Yes, he says. She says that without consciousness, you cannot experience anything. Yes. Wait, wait, wait for that. Huh? Yes. So does that mean? Appearances do not exist. In uh, the abstract. Let me stop you carefully. Outside appearances. Appearance outside, both are in consciousness. Are they not? Yes. What is the notion of outside inside? Outside the body. But body and outside the body, do, do they not both appear in your consciousness? Yes. Yes. Now think about outside the consciousness. What is outside consciousness? Nothing. Ah, very good. Very good. What is outside consciousness? Nothing. What is this consciousness relationship between you and this consciousness? No relationship. You are that. Outside you, what is there? Nothing. Everything that you experience in life is in you, the awareness. And actually, it is not in you, the awareness. In consciousness, can a table exist in consciousness? No. If there's a physical table outside, even that physical table cannot come into your eyes. You have to call 911. <laughs> eyes can receive only light. This is our understanding. And the mind can receive only thoughts. Even optical impulses, brain signals cannot come into the mind. True or not? So mind can receive, there can be only thoughts in the mind. And the mind appears in consciousness. In consciousness, what can there be? Only consciousness. So we are reduced to this ama amazing position. Whatever we are experiencing, whoever we are experiencing and time and space and all of that, matter and energy is nothing but consciousness. You, the consciousness. How do you do this? It's a good question that you asked. So here is the technique. Have you seen this in pujas you do? Phat, phat, phat. Uh, first, phat is a, uh, is a bija mantra. So phat, you reduce this notion of external world into perceptions. You Notice that our, in my experience, there are only perceptions. Apart from perceptions, there is no possibility of knowing an external world. At this point, Bill, Bill Conrad, he said, stop. I can put a camera, this camera, and we can all leave the room, and then come back and see. And in the camera, the picture of the room, the room will be there, even without our consciousness, we are all out there. But I said, ah, Bill, but... In your consciousness, you decided to set up the experiment. In your consciousness, everybody left the room. And in your consciousness, there was an empty room. In your consciousness, you come back and check the camera. In your consciousness, camera shows you an empty room. Is that true or not? He said, that's right. What I said yesterday, both known and unknown are appearances in consciousness. The first thing is reduce everything. Reduce means notice everything that you know in life, or you experience, directly experience in life. There are many things you know which are not um, sense perceptions. You read them. They are mental. We'll come to that. But before that, everything that you experience uh, is sense perception. So, part. But all the sense perceptions, like the tables, is which is seeing only, is mental, subtle, part. The second one. And what is a mental uh, appears in the mind is nothing other than consciousness. The causal level you make. Three levels. Stula, Sukshma, Karana. You dissolve the Stula into perceptions only. Perceptions into mind only. Mind only into consciousness only. This is the transition between um, gross to subtle. Subtle to uh, causal. 
thought, causal to consciousness only. Thought. What do you do this with? With anything that you uh, uh, encounter in life. Do it mentally. So in the front of an annoying person, don't do thought, thought, thought. <laughs> Thus, I dissolve you into consciousness. <laughs> He'll probably punch you on the nose if you do that. <laughs> Good. Good question. Now, last one, we'll do 12th and then, then we'll take a few questions. 12th. Tata chin matra ruposti. Tata chin matra ruposti. Sorry. Tata chin matra ruposi. Tata chin matra ruposi. Nate binnam idam jagat. Nate binnam idam jagat. Ata kasya katham kutra. Ata kasya katham kutra. Heyo padi ya kalpana. Heyo padi ya kalpana. My child, you are pure intelligence itself. So see the words they use, don't get confused. Swami Vivekananda says knowledge itself. He means consciousness, awareness. Here, the translation is your pure intelligence. means pure consciousness, awareness. Uh. Ata kasya. Okay. My child, your pure intelligence itself. This universe is nothing different from you. Very important point. What we are doing just now. What she asked was, how is this not different? This is external to me. By this process of analysis, we see what seems to be external to me. If we carefully track in our experience, it is in our experience, not separable from our experience, nothing but awareness. Therefore, how and where can anyone have the idea of acceptance and rejection? What follows from this? See, first of all, chin matra ruposi. You are pure consciousness. Oh, child, you are pure consciousness. How do I know this? Apply all the techniques you have learned in Vedanta in so many years. Any one of them. Uh, here is the body. I thought I'm the body. Start with that. I'm not going, to, going into all of that. We have done it so many times. For certain reasons, I am not the body. I am changeless. The body is changeful. Nitya, uh, uh, Savikara, Nirvikara. Uh, I am the witness. The body is the witness. Uh, drashta and Drishya. I am aware. The body is an object in my awareness. Chit, Jada. For all these reasons, I am not the body. Similarly, subtler, more inwards. Anyuantara, Atma, Pranamaya. More inwards you go. Breath, the subtle body. Am I that? For the same reasons. Savikara, Nirvikara, Drashta, Drishya, Chidjada. Not the subtle body also. It's an object. Go deeper, the mind. I am Manomaya. I am not even that. Go deeper, the intellect, which is doing all this. I am not even that. Go deeper, blank. The causal state experienced in deep sleep or Samadhi. That's also experienced. It's an object. I am not even that. And I am the witness of all of these. In Sanskrit, Pancha Kosha Vilakshana Atma, Pancha Kosha Sakshi Atma, different from the five sheets, the witness of the five sheets, I am pure consciousness. Same thing, waking, dreaming, deep sleep. I am the fourth pure consciousness, the witness of these three states of waking, dreaming, deep sleep, which rotate before me day and night. Drik Drishya Viveka. I am pure consciousness, witness of the mind, of the senses, of the external world. This is pure consciousness. Good. Now what do I have? I am pure consciousness. And the rest, external world, physical body, vital body, mind, intellect, all of them are nature. I label them all Prakriti. Two things. I and this. It's not very difficult to arrive at. Then he says, but this is not outside you. Nate bhinnam midam jagat. The universe which you separated yourself from. I am pure consciousness. This is the universe. Whatever is this is not I. Anidam chaitanyam. Not this. Neti, neti, neti. I am the pure consciousness which cannot be denied. But all that you denied by neti, neti, that is also not different from you. 
what we did just now reduce it all back hmm? reduce it all back to yourself don't go around the world doing that <laughs> but you might have noticed it in puja as it's done yeah. yeah many people don't know the meaning of it yeah. but but huh? Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhists, they use this. Any problem, he says, you reduce it. Reduce it from, first of all, it's a perception. Our real problem is it's outside. That guy, annoying guy, outside neighbor, but outside neighbor, annoying guy, whole thing is something that you are seeing and hearing. Perception. But what you are seeing and hearing is nothing but a thought in the mind. How can a thought in my mind be an annoying guy? It's a thought. And the thought in the mind is nothing apart from me, the endless, limitless ocean of awareness. The last part. Hmm. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. You have to... to take this advice from Atman, the intelligent reason is confused in term of life because people, ordinary people cannot reflect borrowing money, a mind to reflect that pure consciousness in any action because the All ordinary right. people I, do not understand, I understand what is your Wait. mind yeah. is saying because it is highly intelligent. Design. Yes. Thank you. Uh, what I mean is, first of all, forget ordinary people. There is no ordinary, extraordinary here. You are. No, all of us. We are the Atman. You are extraordinary. So all of this shraddha, it should be possible for all of us. All right. Then, therefore, ata kasya katham kuto kutra he upadeya kalpana. If this entire universe is not different from me, he upadeya. Upadeya, to be gained. I want money. I want friends. I want likes on Facebook. I want selfies. All of this, upadeya. Here, I want to get rid of annoying people. I want to get rid of uh, COVID. I want to get rid of this and that. Uh, all of that is it all objective. Idam jagat. Something is nice, something is bad. But we just realized all of it is nothing but me. Where will you get rid of this? Getting rid of it means what? I'm going to separate this from myself. But here and there, both are in you. Where will you separate it? If you toss away something in, in your dream, it still remains within you. <laughs> ah. And nothing can be tossed away that way. And even in the world of causality, it will follow you. Karma. <laughs> it will come in another form. Achha. Where will you toss it away? Because everywhere is within you. Then he says, Katam, how will you toss it away? Because it is you. Can I toss myself away? Can I get rid of myself? No. Can I get myself? Can I attain myself? No. What that means is, you are sitting in the chair. What do you have to do? Suppose I say, yeah, what do you have to do to get to the lake? You can tell me. Get up from here, go out by that door, walk down that, you will get to the lake. But suppose I ask you, what do you have to do to sit in that chair? Where do you have to go to sit in that chair? Nothing. What journey do you have to accomplish to get to that chair? Nothing. In fact, if you try to do anything, you'll go away from the chair. Then the only possible journey there is to remove the ignorance, the idea that I am not in the chair. That has to be removed. I say, you know what spiritual life is like from Ashtavakra's perspective. I gave the example once. We were in Vedanta Society in New York. I said, suppose you ask me, how do I get to Vedanta Society of New York? I say, you're there already. And if you're not convinced, no, uh, how can I be there already? People talk about so much long journey, subway, or, or the search for parking. I did not experience any of that. How could I have reached Vedanta Society? So if you have all these doubts about not reaching Vedanta Society, if you, re if you really insist on a journey, then I'll tell you, all right, then get up, go to the door, open the door, go outside, then walk down the road, go down, go up, 
71st Street, take a left turn, and then go to the walk, keep walking, you will see 70th Street, then take a left turn, and then go walk down, you will see Central Park West, take a left turn, you'll go work. follow these instructions carefully, and then we will finally come, take a left turn again, 71st Street, you'll walk down, you'll see 34 West 71st Street, enter, and come and sit down here, you will have arrived at Vedanta Society of New York. We'll stand on this. And all of that journey you have accomplished to get to where you were in the first place. That is spiritual practice. And I don't need it. Very good. But if you don't need it, then you're not allowed to complain anymore. There should, should be no problem anymore. If there is a problem, then you need that practice to see that you are Brahman. All right. Uh, let me just read out Hold on. what Bairam said to this, the final verse. Child, you are pure awareness, nothing less. Chin matra. Nothing less. Nothing more. You and the world are one. So who are you to think you can hold on to it or let it go? How could you? <laughs> I will be um, uh, rich and famous. I have to get all these things. Then only I'll be happy. Wrong. I have to give up everything. I'm all renouncing monk sitting in the highest Himalayas. Then I will be Brahman. Wrong again. He who runs away from the world, Vivekananda. He who runs away from the world and uh, uh, to meditate and die in a Himalayan cave, uh, thinking that and searching for God, he has missed the way. Vivekananda says, he who plunges immediately then, says, I'm all right then, I haven't run away to the Himalayan cave. He says, he who plunges into the foolishness and the vanities of the world, he too has missed the way. Then what is there? Either, either you accept this or you reject this. What else is there? So no, the way, then what is the way? The way is to deify the world, to see God in everything and everyone that you are with, in every action, every person, everywhere you see the divine, the divinity. Then you have God here, you have God in the Himalayas also. Yes. Yes. Mm. If you follow Ashtavakra, you can get it right now. If you're feeling that, no, it's not happening, then do spiritual practices. Yes. All right. What's the question? Uh, Pranam Maharaj, uh, you mentioned this method of dealing with an object or an happening in real world, the method of put, 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 mm -hmm. to reduce it into an object of sensory perceptions, then of the mind, and then ultimately dissolve it in a causal uh, way. And the example was of generally an annoying situation or a person or whatever. How do you avoid the danger of an unintended consequence of practicing this method of the mind reversing it to suit it to oneself, uh, thinking that, you know, it doesn't matter whether I am a person that causes annoying situations because ultimately I will rely on the others to do part, part, part and get rid of it. Uh, it's a complicated way of putting it. But then I will not uh, do that for anybody else if I have realized that I am Brahman. When does a person um, create problems for others, for himself, herself, and for others? It's only when we are identified with this particular body and mind, and for us, there are others. Yeah. Imagine from the perspective of a person who feels I am one with the world. The only kind of feeling this person for other, will have for others will be one of love, will be one of reverence. You know, uh, one monk said, one brahmachari asked in, in our monastery, so how should we, uh, what relation do I have with my fellow brahmacharis, other monks, uh, young monks and all? So the senior monk, he gave beautiful advice, I still remember. The relationship you have with your guru that is the best relationship you have in the world. The most sacred, the most solemn, the most, you try to keep it the most pure. You have the same relationship with everybody else in the world. At least try. Now that person will be very careful of not 
creating trouble for others, not annoying. When we create trouble for others, when we are annoying, it's often either carelessness or a kind of don't care attitude about others that always comes from ego. And the ego is body centric. I am this person. If I have a sense of oneness with others, I'll never do that. Even if, I an mean, interesting thing, even if you are annoying to others, if you have the sense of oneness, that sense of not the body, not the mind, I am the witness consciousness, or in a devotional sense, a very strong sense of the presence of the divine within you. And you end up annoying others. You can, people can get offended, even if you don't intend to. You end up offending others. They will also not feel all that bad. They will sense at some level, you are their well-wisher. At some level, they'll sense the holiness in you. I remember one of the Swamis long ago, um, in the early 20th century here in America. He said something sharply scolded this American lady who snapped back, back at him. Swami, if anybody else had ever behaved like this with me, I would never see his face again. But I know you are a holy man. That's why I keep coming back. You sense it. And the opposite is also true. It could be a very refined person, wonderful behavior, very sweet, very courteous. You may like it, but you may not feel that, that depth, that spiritual um, you know, uh, radiance in that person. You may feel, I've seen this. I'm comfortable um, with the scoldings of this holy man. And the praise of this other worldly person makes me uncomfortable. That we all feel that. You all feel that. So the main thing is to be centered. I am Atman or take the other attitude. It's, if it's difficult, the Lord, I'm always conscious of the presence of God inside, outside. Both will work. Okay, let's take an, a, a question at least from the virtual audience. Swamiji, this is a request for clarification on the 10th verse, the verse Tavachin Matra Rupina, all the translations seem to ignore the word Rupina. Does the word here mean a form of consciousness? Hmm. No, not form of consciousness. Consciousness itself is formless. So Chin Matra Rupina is just a figure of language. It meets, means Chin Matra. What is your nature? Of what form are you? Your form is formlessness. What is your nature? Your nature is consciousness. Chin matra rupina. Consciousness only. Yeah. This uh, question here, Shekhar. We'll end with this because we have run out of time. Pranam Swamiji. Yes. First of all, thank you so much for all the wonderful teachings these past four days. I sure everybody agrees. But they have been very spiritually rewarding and inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. And speaking, you know, thinking of uh, the theme of the retreat, uh, my question is, is it fair to say that bhakti is uh, predominantly the function of heart and Advaita Gnana is predominantly the function of mind? Mm -hmm. uh, if so, I was wondering, you know, how much of a role heart plays in the Advaita Gnana? Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> it's a good question. A monk whom I respect very much once told me, you know, you think that Advaita is uh, a function of the intellect, that this non-duality is understood by the intellect. No, non-duality is understood by the heart. Look at this book. Not the intellect of awareness, the heart of awareness, not the mind of awareness, the heart of awareness. Yes. That oneness is uh, uh, easily grasped and put into practice by the heart. And of course, devotion is of the heart also. Um, but if you read the texts, Upanishads and the post Shankara texts, the importance of a subtle intellect is there. Sukshma buddhi, a subtle way of seeing. So this way of seeing, the subtle way of seeing, seeing means understanding, it must be cultivated. Our way of seeing is still so gross. Gross means physical. 
that's why advaita seems difficult the more we cultivate a subtler way of seeing things instead of seeing the effect try to see the cause when you begin to see the cause try to see what's beyond the cause the reality beyond the cause yeah so heart and intellect both a subtle intellect swami bhuteshan ji used to say shuddha buddhi shukha buddhi na subtle intellect here does not mean a high iq there are people with high iqs who have no belief in god who have who do, when you say oh they are i have belief in god just go and teach them advaita they won't get it it's very interesting very sharp intellect they won't get it i face this if it was so easy then the there's so many sharp minds they would have all become non dualists it's not it's it's a subtle mind but it means subtle in the sense of purified mind a purified mind gets it i have seen myself uh, monks in our monastery who are very simple who who don't cultivate so much philosophy who don't keep reading uh, non dualism eastern western philosophy and science and they don't do that they have a simple devotion to thakur but when i talk to them i discuss sometimes i talk about some of these issues they grasp it just like that it seems true to them it seems obvious to them so what is the difference a, a subtle philosopher is still uh, reluctant about accepting this the logic i have i have talked to a very sharp this lady was on a plane next to me uh, she said so tell me about you are obviously a man of religion so tell me about your belief system explain advaita she was a um, a neuroscientist going for a conference very sharp person she understood all of it so this is a very quick on the uptake she understood all of it and she said at the end of it i can't find any fault in what you are saying but i don't believe it good om shante 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 hari hi om tat sat shri ram krishna rupa namastu the end of the retreat we give a jai jai shri guru maharaj ji ki jai जय महामाय की जय जय स्वामी जी महाराज जी की जय